So thank you. And I'll turn it over to Jen Gro. Okay, so welcome everybody. It's great to see you. I just want to know if anyone else has another question. I'll collect them. And even though we're running a tiny bit over, what I think is special about the school, one of the one of the really beautiful things about the school is the sense of community. So if we could just take an extra few minutes for everyone to introduce themselves and to say who you're here for in the eighth grade, I think it would be nice. And I want to thank Alan and Shira in advance for hosting the eighth grade brunch this Sunday. Hope you guys can enjoy it. So can you start, Marcia? Sure. I'm Marcia Glickman, and I am here for Noah. Um, who was our fourth child to be going to the high school next year. Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca Monson, I'm here for Shoshana. Doug Epstein, I'm actually here for myself, but you know, Caleb Epstein is here for me. I'm Carol Wilson, and Bob Wilson, and we'll review for Ben. Bill Hirschman, here for my wife, Jennifer, so I'm sick with the kids. Uh, for Benji, oh, yeah. uh, for, for Benjamin Hirschman. Laura Solomon, here for Adeem Solomon, in eighth grade. Mark Solomon. Leo, you can say hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm in 11th grade, and I'm just here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just <hysterical. laughs> We'll get her a t-shirt, don't worry. <laughs> hi, I'm Beth Layden. Hi, Mom, here for Ezra. I'm Anad Becker. I'm here for Sammy Becker. Aaron Becker for Sammy. I'm Bob Tierney. I'm here for Sammy Becker. Aaron Becker for Sammy. I'm Bob Tierney. and Dennis here somewhere as well, and our eighth grader is Elliot Warshawski. So you're up. So I'm, I'm Jay Dorsch, I'm here for Emma, and Emma's the fourth. Um, this one. Pardon? We'll come back to all, you'll get a chance to everyone staff. I'm Ron Ofer, uh, <laughs> and I'm here for Julia, who just started in eighth grade. I'm Janet Bauman, and uh, I'm here for Jacob Parrish. I am Marcia Friedman, I'm here for Noah Friedman, maybe. Uh, Naomi Colton uh, for Todd. I'm Michael Clark, I'm here for Andy Clark's children. Showtouts, my wife Shelley, and we're here for Jared. Shanna Schwartz, I'm here for Chase Denenberg, and he's uh, my youngest, but the other two were not great for children. Well, we're so glad to have you all here, and this is my esteemed team, and we're all going to have a chance to talk with them a little bit more, but we wanted to put the students on first because it's a school night, and um, <laughs> we want to make sure they get home. So I'm just going to ask everyone here to introduce yourselves. And you can say if you are an active student, what grade you're in, and if you've graduated what year, and where you are now. Um, and then we'll take a where, just came from. where you came from, right, and what grade you may have started. Okay. You, you want to start, Sarah? I'll start. Okay. Just stand? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> can, see me? Can. can you no, see you? I'm okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Sarah Fetterman. I am a junior. It is... I'm new, it's actually like my second day here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, but yeah, I came from MUS, like MUS is the 11th grade program that we have a trimester in Israel. So I spent time with my grade there and I really enjoyed it. But before that, I um, started, like spent the first half of my life at Foreman, Froman, and then I went to Abington for a little bit, but now I'm back by choice. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jake Wishnia. Uh, I started at uh, Perlman and then went to Saladman, left and went to uh, a friend's school for a year, decided to come back to Akiba. I graduated in 2007, then went to Penn, and now I work. Shade. I came here in 2008 from Welsh Valley Middle School. 
and I went to Gladden Elementary School, so I went to the Lower Merion public school system. Um, and now I'm at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Noah Block. Um, started in ninth grade, came from Kelman Academy in Cherry Hill, and uh, commuted every day from Cherry Hill. Um, now I'm at Haverford after a year in Texas. <laughs> I'm Avi Romanov. Uh, I basically got enrolled at birth. Uh, <laughs> my older brothers uh, went here, graduated six through seven through twelve back then. I've been here since sixth grade. I'm currently a senior. And president, third Romanov to be president this year. <laughs> <laughs> really Romanov time. Really Romanov. It's not a joke. Okay, so Hi, I'm Shoshana. Um, I just graduated last year, so I'm a freshman at F and M, and I went to Perlman and then here for middle school and high school. I'm Ann Presky. I'm a senior, and like. Um, I went to Perlman for elementary school and then back for middle school back for high school. Hi, I'm Sophia Schulson. I'm a senior as well. Um, and I a fun story. I have a fun story. Um, but su suffice to say, I um, went to Jewish day school in Florida for uh, elementary school and middle school, and then I came here in ninth grade, left again in tenth grade, came back in eleventh <laughs> grade by choice uh, as well, and I've been here ever since. She I'm moved away in Chicago. Yeah, it, <laughs> back to Florida. Hi, I'm Andy. I went to Baldwin, which is an all-girls preparatory school in the area from kindergarten to ninth grade, and I came here in tenth grade. Hi, I'm Corey. <laughs> <laughs> I was at Perlman, and then I went to Saligan, and then I came here by choice. And now I'm here in eleventh grade. Here by choice. <laughs> Sophia just went. Sophia is here last year and this year without her family, boarding with a family in Indian area. So because she was so brave. <laughs> so, we all act as her mom and dad. Oh yes, definitely. So I think it's such a great testament, first of all, that you're all here, um, but also that these guys are all here. And I have to tell you, when I put out the request for people to come. You know, people had dinners at their universities and jobs, and everyone very quickly said yes, whatever I can do. And I think that I want to make, now we're going to like take a little time to unpack some of, you know, who you are and what, what your stories are. And I also want to remind you, if you want to write a question, you can, if you just want to raise your hand and ask. Um, but does anybody feel like they want to start with a question? Okay, I'm going to read one. Hmm. Okay, this is for the alumni in the house. For those of you about to be alumni, God willing. What skill from Barrick did you use in college that surprised you? That's a good question. Does anyone want to take it? Or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say there, there's two skills. Um, so, so I went to UConn for undergrad, and I was surprised by how many students did not know how to write a paper and how many students had not written more than three pages. Um, you know, at least when I was here, you know, we were writing 10 pages, you know, 10 page papers by the end of uh, senior year. Uh, so you, you'll go into college being a good writer. And also, um, in the classroom here, they very much promote discussion and, and argument. And you'll definitely know how, to, you'll know how to speak by the time you get to college and present your argument. And that was also something that a lot of students Um, can I add on? Sure. I would say there's definitely two things that I found surprising. The first is the ability to connect with professors and teachers. Um, I know that there's a lot of talk about how great the teachers are at Akiva, and it's Barrick now, sorry. Um, and it's definitely stress to build relationships with them, to go see them for help if you need it. Um, and a lot of my friends in college are very curious, why are you interested in talking to your professor outside of class? Like. What do you mean? You're just going to go say hi. Like, you don't have a question. You didn't fail the test. Why would you want to get to know them? And I can tell you, I have found so many great opportunities for research just to hear more, to see what professors are doing. I have one that I'm working for next semester that um, 
He's the Felix Zanman Endowed Professor at Penn, who he was really involved at Akiba, and we made that connection right away. Um, and he knew of our school through Felix, and we like talked for hours about his book. Um, and then the other, I would say, is pluralism. And in the religious context, there's a lot of, at Penn, there's a lot of Jews, and there's a lot of observant Jews. But that doesn't mean they all get along. And there's a lot of different organizations that I'm involved with that don't even agree with each other, and I'm a member of a few of them. And I think there's a lot to learn from religious pluralism and connecting with other students and understanding what they think and dialoguing with other religions other than Judaism. And uh, yeah, it's talked about this as like a pluralistic Jewish day school, but I was really surprised the skills and how valuable it was on the college campus. Yes, yeah, so I just want to go off what Michael said with the pluralism. Um, last year in Israel, I roomed with four, four people from, uh, four very orthodox uh, guys from Chicago. We didn't really understand what it was like to be a secular Jew, so I, I had that experience and being very comfortable with expressing my opinion. And uh, now that I'm a habit from sort of the opposite of the spectrum, um, a lot of secular Jews sort of hard to understand how to be, how to maintain your Judaism while still being, you know, very secular. And um, another thing I was surprised about was sort of the work ethic that you build up at Akiva or Barrack. Um, last year, technically, I thought everyone would be, you know, in their room studying all night. Um, but a lot of people would sort of get behind in their work, but I was sort of on top of it with the skills I learned. Yeah. Um, I did not think that the Jewish studies classes would carry over to my college career, but the Jewish studies classes here really teach you how to think and like really question your beliefs and question other people's beliefs, and that is really important for a college career and just for life skills in general. And also. It's just a side note, but I have a friend who is in contact with a Jewish studies teacher here because she misses the Jewish studies classes here. <laughs> so she sent me a picture today of the, I think it's, of some readings she has to do, and they email back and forth about them because she just finds that these Jewish studies classes really are important for her, and I completely agree. And Shoshana, five years ago when someone asked you why you thought maybe you, want, you were having an itch to go, what was the answer? My itch to go was that the Jewish studies classes were not an important part of my life, and I completely disagree now. Yes. For the students here who left the Jewish studies school system and then came back, I'm interested in hearing what led to that decision. Okay, so Sarah, okay, the first thing. Okay. Um, I. Why, like, what made us want to come back to the Jewish day school system? Why you Okay, um, I guess just, like, to try new things is what kind of why I left. I was really young. I mean, I was, like, 10-ish, I guess. So my parents kind of, like, we have the say. I guess they kind of wanted me to have, like, another experience. But now, like, my little sister has stayed in the system all the way through. So, I mean, she's now in Barrack in seventh grade. And, um, I really... Like, I went to a big public day school, and I really just, like, I went to Hebrew school. I wasn't getting anything out of Hebrew school. I was, like, I knew more than the other kids there. I felt like I wasn't learning anything. It was almost a waste. And I really had, like, a, I don't know if it was like a pa well, yeah, like a passion. Like, I just really felt, like, strongly about my Jewish education. And I really loved being Jewish. And I'd go to my old school, and, like, nobody, okay, my, like, a lot of my friends were Jewish, but nobody was very, like, I never got any, like, negative racism, I guess you could say. Anti-Semitism, I'm sorry. Anti-Semitism for um, when I was there, but there were like jokes going around. Just like it's not as comfortable as I know my sister is, and how I used to feel at Perlman. And just like, I really, I just, I just really miss the comfort and nurturing and the Jewishness like all around you. I just something really special that you don't get everywhere for sure. And especially like when I made my like transition like Hebrew school, I was really like wow, like what am I like really missing out on it? I gave like my old school like couple more years I could try it out like there are things I liked about it but it was just like I felt right here and I'm really like really really glad to be back and especially after Israel on the Hamas program that even more like emphasized why I made the transition that I have made. Sarah came back like she came to visit with her family on that middle school visiting day we had last year <laughs> just to come like to support her family. My and sister. We and then her dad's like, really? You know? <laughs> um, so, and then Sarah had the like, courage to just get on a plane and go to Israel with Mus, you know, not knowing most of the kids in the class. So.
Uh, yeah, so, um, so I, I, I left Jewish King School and I, um, I think it's because uh, I was, yep, uh, I left in 8th grade and I was very uh, rebellious in my Jewish studies classes. I did not like taking Hebrew. Uh, in all my Jewish studies classes I was questioned and argued back, uh, which is actually something that the teacher did encourage. Maybe yeah, not we'd love that. Studies during Hebrew class, <laughs> the Jewish studies, yes. Um, so I thought I'd you know, like to try uh, one of the friend schools because you know, they're supposed to be more accepting and you get to see all this diversity and you know, you see all these other different points of view. And it really wasn't the case. Um, you know, at Akiva you can be, you know, right wing, left wing, libertarian, it doesn't really matter. You know, you can hash out your opinion in class and, you know, your teachers are still going to like you, they're not going to fail you or anything like that. Uh, it, at the friend school I went to, it was different, um, and uh, it was, uh, it was, you know, it, it was difficult being, uh, you know, a, a, a Zionist in, uh, in a friend school. All the teachers there are pro-Palestinian. Um, yeah, it was, it was very interesting. There was actually one experience that I can talk about. Um, there's a, they are required to take religious studies class. And uh, during one of those classes, they were talking about modern-day Israel. And the teacher kept saying, or as some would call it Palestine. Now, if you're talking about modern-day Israel, you don't call it Palestine. It's a historical class, yes. But And so I you know, like said that you can't call it that because that's not the name of it. There's no country Palestine. And I actually got sent to detention. And, uh, yeah, it was, um, and uh, my advisor, who was the vice principal of the school, happened to be Jewish never did anything about it. So it was just, it was very one-sided, and they weren't open to, you know, all of these different points of view. Um, so I, I think that's ultimately what led me to come back, is that even though, you know, Barak or Akiva was 100% Jewish, it was very accepting for whatever point of view, you know, you might have. So, um, I spent uh, one year in, in public school in, in tenth grade because I um, both of my parents are college English professors. Um, they had a, my dad had a sabbatical the year that I was in ninth grade. I was uh, I lived in Miami, Florida, my whole life up, up until that point. Um, we came up for the year in ninth grade. I thought it was just going to be for the year. Uh, I had an incredible time. I made amazing friends, but. Back of my mind, I knew that I was going back to Florida um, at the at the end of that year. So um, uh, in tenth grade, I came back to to Miami, and I went to public school. And and it was interesting because in for me, even though I had been in Jewish day school my whole life, I actually didn't really get that itch. I I loved Jewish day school. I I loved having you know Hebrew classes and. Uh, Bible classes. I just I loved having that extra aspect of my my education. Um, but I you know I'm like I'm a curious person I guess and and you know as I began to think about college a little bit it it <laughs> it, it seems like it would be a good idea to get an experience in a school that had more kids in it. Um, so the school that I was uh, in in tenth uh, grade had three thousand kids. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a big step, but I, and I, I didn't have a horrible time. I, I made a lot of really great friends, I learned a lot, and I think the fact that despite all of that, I still missed Jewish day school and I still wanted to come back, speaks more to how much it means to me than, than anything else. I mean, if I had had a horrible time in public school, it would have made sense for me to want to go back. But I made a lot of great friends. None of them were Jewish. I took a lot of classes that I, you know, I, I hadn't been exposed to in middle school, mostly because it was middle school. Um, but I still wanted to come back, and I still I started actively seeking out ways of to reconnect to my, my Jewish education. I, I started to have this real fear that I was going like, to lose my Hebrew, and I wasn't going to get any farther in my, my Bible studies. So 
my dad set me up with the Hillel rabbi at the University of Miami so I could meet with him on Tuesday nights after school, and it still wasn't enough. Um, so in the end, when uh, my, fam my parents told us that they were moving up to, they live in Boston now, my life is confusing. Um, <laughs> um, instead of, instead of uh, going with them and probably attending another public school, I, we talked about it, we sat down, it was a hard decision. Um, but I ended up coming back here, and I, uh, <laughs> and I, I, <laughs> I stay with uh, family friends, and but but everyone kind of adopted me, and and you know we we make jokes about it a little bit, but you know I have my family in that area, and then I have my family here, and I I kid you not, my parents announced that I was coming back, and they got emails from about four or five of my teachers in ninth grade saying that they would be willing to host me like on the weekends if I got homesick and you know all it just it's just it's such a wonderful wonderful place and I'm you know I I appreciated my time in public school in 10th grade I'm glad that I did it I think that it will help me um, get ready for uh, for college but it was nothing like what I got here so. very well put why didn't you go to Boston? Um, partially because it would have been my third high school in three years, and I just, you know, I, I, I can make friends. I was a little bit worried at the beginning of ninth grade that I'd forgotten how, um, but I didn't. I have friends. <laughs> um, but you know, three years—it's a lot for another first day of high school, and it just, it. It just, it, there was, obviously there's logic in following my family and living with my family, but there was also logic in going back to the place that I had had such a wonderful time in ninth grade and, you know, reconnecting with the friends that I had made in ninth grade. And I, um, you know, they were real friends. I went to a very small school in, um, in uh, elementary school and middle school, and I was friendly with the kids in my class because we had been, you know, in the same class for nine years. But when I came to Barrett, I made actual friends. Friends who enjoyed the same things that I did, enjoyed my company, and I just, I didn't want to give that up. I didn't want to risk giving that up. So. Ellie, I can't talk after you guys finish. I'm like, <laughs> For those of you who are in either the real world or in college now, uh, to what degree have you had discussion maybe with folks or friends of yours that are come from the public system? What have you found to be, what was, what were the most difficult transitions for you? Going to the college environment, uh, or into real life from, from your perspective? Like, who do you want to answer? Anybody. Anybody wants, anybody who's in college or who's not working. What's the most difficult transition maybe that you can compare to maybe your friends or uh, fellow students that maybe went to the public school? Well, just finishing my first semester, I would say the people, this is this is a broad statement, but the people who went to really big high schools weren't an ominous tiny school. They weren't going to the professor's office hours. They weren't necessarily taking taking advantage of the fact that your professors are there to help, help you, but so are your students, your fellow students. And I think coming from here, it was a really easy adjustment knowing that, okay, my professor's office hours are wherever, but I have his cell phone number also, and I'm not afraid to call it if I need to meet with him at another time. <laughs> and I'm also, like Michael said, I'm not afraid to go to my professor's office hours to go talk to him about life and whatnot. And also, kids from public school definitely, I think, had a harder time with the workload. And I, I'm i fine with the workload in college because you got it, you got it hard here, but it prepares you, and I'm thankful for that now. touch on the workload. I think having a dual curriculum, it, yeah, you're learning a lot. I mean, you're gaining s of the Jewish studies, but it also teaches you a lot about time management and prioritizing and figuring out what you need to do in life to get the work done. And a lot of kids in college are just so lost between partying or meeting friends or going out for dinner and getting the work done. And they struggle a lot at getting like four classes or five classes. You're not taking so many in college. But since we were taking eight, nine classes, we know what to expect, and we're, I think, so much better off. Did any of you feel like you were very, you, you wanted to go in a direction that maybe a public school or a different school would have had more 
opportunity for you and coming here would limit it for you, for example, sports or computers or something that maybe a bigger sport, a drama could have given you more access to. And if that's if that's the case, how did you sort of um, you know find your way? Since I'm wearing a sports jersey, I apologize for my like, sloppy appearance. By the way, we uh, just had a basketball game about like less than an hour ago. Um, I don't think. I mean. I can only speak for myself and the opportunities that I desired over the course of my, my uh, four years of high school. But I didn't find them limited. I mean, um, I, was almost, I was kind of overwhelmed a little bit at the beginning of senior year at the, the number of classes that we were offered. And I was disappointed that I wouldn't be able to take all of them. <laughs> um, and as for sports, um, I mean, I, I tried out for the basketball team in 10th grade, and I, um, I played on, on JV, but I didn't get moved up to varsity until like the very, very end of the, the season. And here, I get to play in every game, and you know, I get to develop a really close relationship with all of the girls, and I get to play different sports. Uh, in, in public school, you're, kind of, you're expected to commit to a single sport, and it's, it's difficult to, it, it's, you know, you're forced to, narrow your horizons at a much younger age, but here I played soccer for the first time senior year, um, and that was, that was an inch, I've never played soccer before, and it was, it was a very interesting experience. <laughs> I, they're laughing because I sprained my ankle in like the beginning of the season. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I love basketball, I get to play basketball here, I love softball, I get to play softball uh, at, in, during the spring. Um, and, you know, we play against competitive schools. We, sometimes we play against schools that recruit, and, and we hold our own against them. Um, so I would not say that those, that at least those opportunities are limited in the slightest. And in fact, they're kind of enhanced, because I wouldn't have got a chance to play as much at a public school. Yeah, I just want to say about, <clears throat> in terms of limits and like what's available and what's not, I found that, I mean, so what I'm really passionate about is, um, about is, is computer science and programming and all these kinds of things. And um, I'll be honest with you, I mean, our school, just because there's only so many kids, only so much time in a day, I mean, I don't know how I could take any more classes, we don't have what some high schools have that, you know, like charter schools for technology. We don't have, like, a state-of-the-art computer science program. But we do have our faculty and administration who are pretty much willing to work with you to do whatever you want. It's the support is, is really what you're investing in. It, it's the curriculum itself, to consider it as a curriculum, is, is somewhat limiting. What, what's important to consider is not just what's offered, but the flexibility that is offered. So for example, I mean, I, I, I've, been, I've been programming for, for pretty much my whole life, and I, I've always loved to do it, and I've gotten so much support <coughs> from the school, doing all that kind of stuff, talking with the computer teacher here, um, and, and just, so for example, one of the things uh, I've worked on and, and I still continue to work on is we have a, a school homework system here. And um, in ninth and 10th grade, you know, people, I, I was president of, of my, uh, of the class of the, of the ninth grade, and people came to me and they said, you know, you, you know stuff about computers, like why is, you know, can you make something that would make our homework experience better here? We've got a dual curriculum, it's, it's very difficult, there's really no software on the market that can let you manage a complicated dual curriculum that's specifically tailored for the, for the barrack homework experience. And so over the next year and a half, with a tremendous amount of support from the teachers and the students, testing and, and, and all that kind of stuff, I basically wrote what is now called Kiva. Um, and is now, it, it's a complete um, alternative interface, but alternative in the sense that actually more people use Kiva nowadays than, than the normal <laughs> homework website, um, that basically, adds, you know, real task management to the homework system, understands that we're in a dual curriculum, all the different courses you have, you can have your own course. I mean, and some of the feedback I got, for example, when I was developing it is, I don't just have the courses that are tracked on the homework website. I'm also, you know, captain of this, president of that, sports, extracurriculars, extra, all that kind of stuff. And so you can actually add your own courses and all that kind of stuff. And, and building that, it wasn't just Yes, I did the programming on my own. I didn't learn how to program in a programming course at Barrick. But what I did learn was, you know, how to work with the administration to, you know, uh, 
cover the, the minimal costs for it, how to get it implemented. You know, I ended up giving presentations to, to different parts of the student body, explaining how it works, working with the teachers, what works, what doesn't, continuing to iterate, having a loving support network of students here that I could work with to iterate on it and test it and, and make it better. And to this day, I, I get emails from teachers and students hey, you know, either I'm having this one issue or I have a great suggestion. Well, we're all so different, but we're all, like, we all just build off each other, and when I talk to my person, I love reading, I love writing, I love editing so much, <laughs> so much. Um, she edits our papers for fun. Yeah. She edits <laughs> our <laughs> academic papers <laughs> for fun. You're going to have some Yeah. To say that? So. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, the teachers, my English teachers, they're like, they're like, send my friends to me for like, whatever. I love English, and I want to be an English teacher. And so, first of all, the, the teaching aspect, I have so many teachers that it's like, my, it's like, why are you so much older than me that I can't like come over to your house and hang out with you because I just love you so much. And like, the best thing in the world is like, is going into the English office or going into the history office. Without a question, just to like hang out, I'm like, hey Dr. Ziskin, how are you? Like, hey Mr. McLaughlin, how's it going? I'm like blushing, I'm so excited. Um, and and so the, the the teaching aspect is fantastic, and and having such incredible teachers who are so willing to like engage with me, be like, you're interested in teaching? Okay, let me just tell teach you about like my teaching techniques is fantastic. Um, my Bible teacher is currently teaching me how to be a teacher at lunch with like other kids in my grade, it's not just me, that would be super weird. But, <laughs> um, so that's really cool. And then the, the English aspect, I have been on our school newspaper since eighth grade when I went to my, when I, actually I talked to my core teacher in sixth grade and said, I want to do writing stuff. She's like, you have to wait until eighth grade, I'm sorry. Um, but I joined in eighth grade and then I was a little scared to to do the <coughs> literary magazine in ninth grade because it was all these like scary seniors and I was really intimidated by them. But my English teacher was like, no, you should totally go for it, you should totally do it. And I sat there like petrified for a couple months without making any comments. But I warmed up to it because they kept telling me to talk. So I talked and I presented my opinion and then eventually I was writing pieces and they actually got accepted. And I'm so now I'm editor in chief of the literary magazine and second in command at the newspaper. And it's just like a world of English and editing, and it's so fantastic. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that's what I love. That's what I love doing. And there have been so many opportunities for it. So actually, this night when, when we were talking about the eighth grade, everyone said, "Talk to Annie Krusty. What was happening for you in eighth grade, and what did you?" Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you mean in terms of wanting to switch schools? Mm -hmm. So in eighth grade, and my two older siblings, neither of them came to Barrett for high school. Um, one because she was in New York, but one because he went to public school, and I was very worried, having been in in Hebrew school since kindergarten, um, that I really wanted a diverse experience, and I was really worried that my options would be stifled um, at Barrack. And I visited other schools, and then I said, "Well, I'm visiting other schools. Why can't I visit Barrack? Because we didn't have this like eighth grade visiting." program, whatever, so I went and I visited the ninth grade classes, and I was like, oh, this is so much better. Um, so I, I ended up staying, which I'm so thankful for. I probably would have missed the Jewish studies a lot. I've only grown to love Jewish studies more, and I'm, I'm really happy that I stayed opportunities-wise. I don't think, at, at another school, I don't think my teachers would have trusted me enough just like hearing from my past teachers, this kid really likes English, to be like, okay, yeah, come join the newspaper, yeah, you can be an editor, like, yeah, you can totally have a position you made up for yourself on the magazine, that's fine. <laughs> like, that is, that's the type of thing that I was only going to get at Barrick, and I'm really happy I stayed. Yeah, I'd like to direct this to those of you who are in college and or who have finished, um, one of the comments I've heard from parents who are considering the school and high school is, you know what, the world outside is not a shadow. And it's time for kids need to go to a school where they'll have a broader, more typical population that they'll experience and see in a college that they won't necessarily see in, in Barrack, because in Barrack, after all, everyone is Jewish and that's the focus of the studies. To, your, to what extent do you think that had 
you agree or disagree with that, given that you're in college and have that experience? Um, I would love to answer that. I was, my okay. sister and I talk about it all the time. Um, how a lot of people make the argument that Barrack isn't diverse. We're all Jews. We're all. She's at Michigan. So she's, she's yeah, and she's a huge sociology person. She's into understanding these issues. And a lot of people say, "Oh, you went to like everyone's the same in your high school." No, not at all. I think Barrack is really diverse but in different ways. Yes, we're all Jewish, but we come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. We come from different states, areas, like parental situations, family situations, and like we're all on different ends of the Jewish spectrum as well, and it exposes us to understanding like, hey, maybe we shouldn't go out to such a fancy dinner because some of us can't afford it. And it brings real life issues that when you're at a public school, Everyone is much more similar because they're coming from the same, I mean, I went to public school, so I know all of my friends, we all were from Gladwin or Villanova, and we lived in similar sized houses, and our parents were lawyers or doctors or something, and there just wasn't as much diversity. And here, I mean, I have kids, like, I've traveled to Cherry Hill. Yeah. You were an accountant. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Jewish jobs, but I can tell you for certain that there is a huge amount of diversity amongst the students here, and I got, like, experiencing public school and then experiencing here, I think that I gained so much by having that one constant, but <coughs> being able to tool with different levels of observance, different levels of, like, the way you treat your parents, and different, I mean, unbelievable amount of diversity, I think, and I did not feel shell-shocked when I got to college. Yeah, I just want to build off of that. I'm not in college, but I've had to explain this to other people um, who, you know, have gone to either private schools or, or giant public schools. And I think people, it's very easy to confuse small and cohesive and a, a community with um, homogenous. Just because we're a small, connected, tight group does not mean we're all the same. And he's absolutely right. Like, we all are very different in very different ways. It's the fact that we all are still a unit and are still a community and mishpacha and all that kind of stuff, that's not in opposition to the fact that we all, you know, it, it's really, the two build on each other. The fact that we are a small, tight-knit community doesn't mean we all, if we were just out in the world, would have become a small, tight-knit community. It's the barrack experience that's allowed that community to exist. It's not just like, Oh well, we're all Jews, and we all come together. And Jews always, you know, agree about everything, and we form a nice, tight unit. Like we know that's not true. It's it, it happens here, and it happens because of the environment here. It's not a function of the, the homogeneousness that, that's just floating around here. I don't know if that's a word. I just like English people. There we go. I don't necessarily agree with the idea that, you know, it's just because the world is so diverse that, you know, it's, it's, it's bad to be in a place where everyone's so similar. You know, the Jewish people are small people. We're supposed to stick together. And that's kind of what you're learning at being at a Jewish, at being at a Jewish school is how to stick together. Um, one thing I definitely okay. noticed... Your friends are really so happy there. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I definitely noticed about, you know, everyone in my grade, my little sister's grade, my older sister's grade, every student that graduates from Akiba is a good person. Even the troublemakers. <laughs> they're good people. And when you get out into the real world, you're not going to see that. Um, there are, I, I met a lot of people in college that just did not think we're, we're good people. And yes, it is a small community, and yes, everyone is Jewish, but I mean, this is the, kind of the time to build that foundation of like, morality, and that's really what you know you kind of get from Barrett. So your, your, your kid's going to graduate with this like, very strong sense of morality, so that's definitely something that's different than you know, any of the other public schools or private schools out there. Just to add to that, it's not only morality, but also a sense of identity. I think that if I sort of diluted in a population in high school, I probably wouldn't have developed to, to be the same person I am now. And then going to college, now I have those experiences, like my own identity to sort of share with a more diverse place. The 
friends you make here are really what help you grow into that person as well because they really support you. And there are people who are like you in some ways, and there are people who aren't like you in some ways, and that's a good thing. And also, I, I think all of us really keep in touch with our high school friends because we really value those friendships so much, and I don't think people from public schools and other schools necessarily feel that closeness with their high school um, graduating class. Final words, you just sort of went down your say Last thing, why, like if you could say anything to your, anyone who's thinking about eighth grade and what to do for high school, final words. We'll just finish the ending and come back to it. Um, I think I'd ask why you why you would want to leave. If, if it's because you're looking for a different experience and you just want to experience something else, I think that's valid. And I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, I would encourage that, going out and trying something new. But if you're leaving because you think you're going to be stifled or because there are like, fantastic opportunities that there's no way you're going to get here, Um, well, what I did was I, when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, whether I was going to keep going to public school or come back here, was I, I made a list of all of the things that I was going to, you know, the things that I wasn't going to be able to get in public school, and the things that I wasn't going to be get, wasn't going to get here. And, you know, I, I'm, I can be, you know, I have to be rational when I make big decisions like that because I can be a very emotional person. And the logic dictated that the the list of things that I wasn't going to get um, at public school that I was going to get at Barrett was much, much longer because I, you know, I I knew the school and after I had learned about the school, I realized that, you know, I wasn't going to be stif stifled um, opportunity-wise um, and I was going to be exposed to a lot of things that I wasn't going to be exposed to um, in, in public school. You know, I have my Talmud class, I have my Hebrew class. You know, I get to take two languages. I get to take Latin and Hebrew. Um, I, on top of my my Bible class and you know all of the secular classes that I have, and, and I wasn't going to get that at, at at a public school. And so it just it was the only thing that made sense. And I I don't see. I mean, obviously. I am one person, and everyone else is, is different. Um, but I, I don't see why that would be incredibly different for anyone else. I think one of the biggest pros about staying here through high school is bus, which I just came back from. And it's just such an amazing learning and growing experience for you in like 11th grade. And I think it teaches you so many skills. like. Um, Michael was talking about like organization and like keeping everything track and I think must really helped me a lot with that because there's so much going around and you're in your rooms with your friends and coming into it I was really nervous that I would get no work done at all and I would just be talking with my friends all night but it really taught me how to like manage my time very well and like do my homework get it done so that I could hang out with my friends because I knew that there was other things going on going on around me so I think must was a really great experience. So if you want to talk about must you can all talk about yes. it. It's really, really true. Like, like obviously, I have really good friends in my own grade, and like kids that have grown up with my entire life, like Poppy. <laughs> but um, like, I like I have really good friends that are a year older, that are a year younger. Like, one of my best friends that I've known my entire life is a year younger, and then another one of my best <coughs> friends is a year older. And it's just like you don't get that at a lot of other public schools and other schools where you can be friends with kids and other grades, and it's just really awesome, really incredible. Um, mine kind of relates to what you were talking about, and that I really, really love my grade. Like, it's just an incredible group of people. We're all so different, but we're all, like, we all just build off each other, and when I talk to my friends who go to public school, I'm like, what? You guys don't have all girls sleepover? Like, <laughs> like, you guys don't have person. random dress up days? That's so weird. Like, we all just... <laughs> Which thing? 
but love each other thing. It happened like <laughs> mostly on Mosh, yeah. but it was always kind of, its roots were always there. Yeah. Um, and like, we wanted to make our senior lounge more beautiful, so we, Andy Fawn came in and painted a mural, and we have, <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and we have like chalkboard paint, and a waffle maker, and we, like, we all, it's just like great to be in a community where we are all friends, and we all get along, and there's not, yeah, there's really not that much drama, I was worried about that, because in my middle school it was smaller, so there was a lot of drama, and it's and none of my friends hate coming to school. Like that's I think high schoolers that's a hard thing to have happen. But I haven't had school in like a couple days now. No days. Yeah, everyone missed each other. One of my friends left and I was like, I'm so excited to come to school tomorrow and I don't think that happens in a lot of places. <laughs> <laughs> Made a pact to not discuss 
where they're applying to school and things like that. And I thought that was wonderful. We have a high school junior elsewhere. But I want to know what the underpinnings of that were, because they were talking about how supportive an environment it is. And obviously, there's an element of competition as well. So maybe you can shed light on the whole culture of what brought that about. Many years ago, back in the Clinton era, I came up with the idea, stealing his words, don't ask, don't tell, but gave him a very different meaning. And the idea behind it is that Unfortunately, our fa faculty and parents mean well, but nobody could go to shul, to a cocktail party, to any gathering without people saying, oh, I hear Susie's in the senior class, where's she applying to college? It's very hard for our kids to have that information out there, particularly with early decision, which means you are bound to go to that school you're accepted. And when kids know that you've applied early decision, and then you don't say anything in mid-December, Everybody knows you didn't get in. We want our, to encourage the idea of our students being cooperative and caring about each other, and Mikhail, I think, was the one who said it, but I think all of our seniors really feel that way. So we encourage a friendly, cooperative, sharing and caring atmosphere, but we ask them not to talk about where they're applying to college. We think it creates competition rather than community. I teach a senior AP class, and it's Kelly, <laughs> 19 kids in that class. A few, I wrote a few of their college recommendations, so I, I know that, but I can't ask. It's like, uh, or I won't ask, right. put it that way. And I'm the head of school, but I won't ask. <laughs> well, is this a year in, year out thing, or does each class decide how they want to handle it? We send that notice out every year, and we also send it to faculty. And we actually give faculty suggestions, and we say to them, You are welcome to ask the seniors, How are you doing? How's the college process going? But do not ask, where are you applying? So that it, it's right. a culture. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is a culture that we've tried to create here. Uh, uh, obviously, the college process has enough stress involved in it. And we feel that this is one way to at least reduce it. I can't say eliminate it. How representative were those kids? <laughs> I think they were pretty representative. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just I, I put out a student ambassador email at the beginning of the the beginning of the school year, which is for me starts in August, right? So I put it out and I think, oh, why did I wait too late? I should have done this in June. No one's gonna come to my orientation, my training. And they come back. And I had 82 kids like sign up, want to come, or on vacation, maybe put something. Like, kids are so passionate about the school. These, kids, they, I mean. Michael gave up a dinner at Penn tonight to be here. Someone has a test tomorrow. Sophia has been playing basketball since three. Like, she <laughs> literally was wolfing <coughs> down dinner so that she could talk to you. And, I mean, I think it's, it's when you think this about This was a very diverse group. Right. Academically, some do athletics, some... We really tried um, to give you an very idea. Very different. But it, you know, you can come back and like visit classes. Right. I you know, you're would encourage that. Like yeah. I think there's no substitute than coming back and sitting in on a class, coming to my chemistry class or coming to Chris's history class or any one of our classes and just sort of being in that moment with the kids when they're in class with their teachers. Um, I, you know, I would encourage each and every one of you to go and do that because you will get a real sense of the fact that this was not fake. Right. Mm -hmm. That this is really who these kids are and who we are as an institution. Um, this was, you know, this was really not for show. We, they love where they learn, where they learn. We love where we work, and so it's not, you know. We're going to be here tomorrow at seven thirty. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know this is really hard to distill to any one sentence, but for the child who right now went from a one percent chance of wanting to come here for high school as a sixth grader to now being fifty fifty. With the poll that would be there for the public school that he could go to, for the breadth of the academics, socially, athletically, is there anything, any bit of wisdom that you would impart or say a reason why he'd want to stay here? Yeah, I, I would say um, my, my son graduated here in the class of 12, and then I've got a daughter also in sixth grade, just about. But um, from talking to both my son and uh, Michael Shade and Noah, who were on the panel, would all agree with this. I think, you know, socially you make lifelong friends, um, and uh, and from people who've had different kinds of experiences, um, they're more likely to make lifelong friends out of a tight-knit school like this. I think that's one piece. I think another piece 
might be, and this is sort of for the adults to sell, and this is the Jewish piece that I think some of the people spoke about. So, you know, as the Jewish studies head, um, I was really pleased by some of the things that, that I paid the students to say. They couldn't have put it better. Education. Right. You know, one of the, you know, one of the, one of the things you get through eighth grade, a slightly more sophisticated response to some of life's big questions. By ninth through twelfth grade, you're really wrestling with theology. Um, tomorrow, tomorrow in my class, if any of you want to come, we're going to be speaking about issues in medical ethics. That they're finally at an intellectual level that they can handle. And Sean's probably doing the same thing. We track each other. Um, they're, they're wrestling with real life issues. They bring in um, two of my students brought in different ethical issues that came up in sports, um, a bullying case, um, a team making a business decision that was lousy for the fans and, and smacked of bad ethics. And so they can, they can really talk about issues with a sophistication that's, that, that doesn't reek of what we derisively call pediatric Judaism. They're really getting adult Judaism here. And then, and then that puts them later on down the road, whether or not they like it, you know, we talk about we create leaders. But what does that mean? It's not like they're going to be necessarily leading the charge or not necessarily running for Congress. But what it means is that people look to them um, to, to represent some knowledge, to represent their people. And that's kind of a thrill for kids that unless you're here and have that opportunity, you're not going to say, you're not going to sign up for ninth grade to say, I want to become a Jewish leader. But I think it's one of those things that happens to you along the way that's a pleasant surprise. I think that's a really good argument. I, I would just like to say, and I think it was evident from what the kids were saying, that <clears throat> they were at a place that they were known, they were loved, and they were strongly encouraged to find something uh, unique inside themselves. And I don't know if you're going to get that anywhere, um, especially at a, at a public school. You, you may get it at other, other small private schools, but you're, you're certainly going to get it here. And it's not, it's not, I don't know Dr. Katz may disagree with me here, it's not about chemistry, but it's not about baseball. It's about the total, the total person that this person is becoming. And man, was that impressive. To, I, I think you saw it. It, it was evident. The, that it was a total person that these people wanted to become, and they were able to get that by being here. I, I sometimes think about it as, as, a, as a parent with three kids who've gone through it. I've got a junior in college, a freshman in college, um, and a 10th grader and an 8th grader. I, I was thinking about this a lot and thinking about something to say about nurtured independence. And as they go, so our 8th graders are think very much of themselves as adults. I know that, um, and I hear that all the time, and that's awesome. Um, but, but, and, this is the thing, as they go into high school, it really is about individuation. All of us that have kids, this is the time where they're really starting to think about who they are as people separate from us, apart from us, and, and apart from, and trying to figure out, okay, so what do I want to do? And so, at a place like Barrett, I feel as a parent, that I can give them that opportunity to do that. Because this is a very safe place. I know they're, I know everybody that's here. I know the teachers love them and know who they are and know how to push them to be the best that they can be, whatever that actually means. Not the best best, the best of who they are. And, and that's both, okay, so that's Jewishly, for them to be able to say, who am I as a Jew? Not who am I as as a Glickman, uh, what, what, is, what does mommy and daddy think about being Jewish? And what does that mean when we go to whatever I make them go to show? But <laughs> what does it mean for me to be a Jew? And how do I articulate it? How do I articulate it in class? How do I articulate it? And I have to say, how, do I, how am I going to be able to articulate it for all of us who know about this now when we're in middle age and have to go to a Shiva minute and have to be part of the community having that base here and having learning how to be a Jewish adult in this environment is extraordinary. And there is no other place, I don't think, that they're going to be able to have that kind of experience. And then how to become a good person, but how to become an independent thinker. Um, and, and then, so, so to me, that's really, that, that's the key. That's the, and, and we talk about the college process. My kids are very different children, all of them. And each of them have been able to pick, have been able to been, have been guided to go to places and pick places that make sense for them, who they are, and what they're about, and what's been exciting for them, and so far so good. So, um, no, I was going to add to that if I could. That I'm sorry, it just happened to walk out. But no, I think you got it. Okay. And they're going so back to people who are up here. We know your son. We know your son. 
and we know your son and your daughter, and they're not just names. We know their strengths. We know their weaknesses. And as they move into high school, I know when I can push Avi Solomon a little bit or Adine Solomon. We know when we can push them when it's necessary. We know when we have to back off. We know what they look like when they come in the morning. Did they have a good night? Did they not have a good night? We know them as true individuals and people. That happens not by magic here. It happens very deliberately by the people who are on in this panel um, and all of their teachers. And having that knowledge of your children is going to allow them to become the best who they can be, the best of whoever they are meant to be, um, in a way that you'll just not find in another place. I can add to that. I just, I promise this is very short. I'm not reading this all this, but one of the emails that I got from a parent I think speaks to what Marsha was just talking about. We're deeply grateful for the many ways in which you have helped our daughter begin the unending process of finding her voice in the world. In my mind, that discovery is the most precious aspect of all of this, no matter where she would have ended up attending college. She got into her first choice, by the way. <laughs> But I think it, it's what Marsha was talking about, is that we're here to help the students figure out who they are. And part of that process happens in choosing colleges and figuring out what your <coughs> priorities are and what, what's important to you as you go into the college process. And it is very different for every child. Any last question? I guess I just, I'm curious to ask this, that the few schools that have been looking at and, uh, and I wonder what the, what the immediate challenges are. I mean, no one wants to stay stagnant. Everyone wants to improve. So what are some of those areas of improvement? Do you want to narrow it down at all? Darren, you can even speak about programming. <coughs> so I think that, um, you know, Doug, you and I had to <coughs> on the phone. Something that is very important to me, and I think it's a necessity going forward in the year 2013 and beyond, is that for our students to have a facility with coding and computer programming. And um, all of our 8th through 12th graders were supposed to participate yesterday in, in the Hour of Code, which is a national program you might have heard. It had made, it made um, headlines this past week. Well, we had a snow day yesterday, but we, we yesterday wasn't quite a restful snow day for me because um, I spent about three or four hours with some of my colleagues finding another time to do it. Because I was, quite frankly, not going to give up for on having this program, we've rescheduled it for next Tuesday. Um, Sharon and I have begun discussions with um, our math chairs about finding some elective time, the third trimester for coding, um, and I, I'd really like to have a class next year. So I think that's, that's going to be a major <coughs> for us going forward. Um, also maybe expanding our world language offerings. I think is going to be important for us going forward also. So those are two areas <coughs> academically um, in which I want to focus. And can I also add that, I, I mean, this is my 28th year at Akiva Barrett, and uh, I can really say that this is a school that, you know, it was always thought to be a very progressive school in the best possible sense of that word, and I like to feel that we constantly work at progressing. And though we're not a school that, you know, opens uh, curricular discussions necessarily up to the community, and, but I think our ear is out there. We listen to parents and listen to students, and we watch very carefully what all the other schools are doing. I meet once a month with the heads of all the independent schools in the area. We have lunch together, everyone from the Haverford School, the George School, the Hill School, you know, Baldwin, et cetera, et cetera. It's called Club 14. There are now about 22 of us. And it's a very cooperative meeting. We share. We know what everyone is doing. We know some of the huge advances people are making. I know which schools are teaching Mandarin Chinese, and I'm listening to whether that's something we want in our school based on the needs of parents and students. I'm watching very carefully at the, sci you know, at the sciences especially when we put the new middle school in. There wasn't a question. We had to have three, you know, and, and a fourth one that's ready to go if necessary, science labs. And 
you know, there are certain teachers we are looking for the best and, um, you know, working to compensate people appropriately, especially in certain areas. This is the 21st century. And I may have come here in 1986, and I'm not... 36 years old anymore as I was then, but, you know, this cannot be the same school it was when it was founded in 1946, though, to be honest, some of our alumni would like that to be the case, and there's a constant ongoing discussion about those things, and it can't be the same school that it was in 1986 when I came, and it has to be a school that's moving forward into the 21st century, and it's not just the sciences or Jewish studies, but Laura is sitting here, and Laura, how many years have you been? Too many. Um, too many. Too many. Too many. Well, but when Laura came, she was very part-time, and the arts program was all after school. It was art majors and a little during school. And, you know, it, it's so different today than it was, you know, years ago. And the expansion of music, when you ask, that is something that we're working really hard to make it put in a much more prominent position. I think when it comes to drama, that's something we've done an excellent job with. Mm -hmm. But the fine arts, and I mean, kudos to Laura. I think she teaches like 15 different courses. Tomorrow alone, yeah, there are two. <laughs> no joke. Did I get it right on the nose? But in all sorts of arts, and using computers. Now that we, every student has an iPad, I mean, I have an arts teacher who got right on the bandwagon, and the things that the kids create on their iPads is amazing. And, you know, to have someone like that, and to have teachers here who are willing to keep learning. And we have a school that is very proud. Teachers want to take courses. They want to take graduate courses, whatever. We handle it. We pay for it. Because we constantly want our teachers to be on a, on a learning curve. And actually, they have to do that. And we support it. So um, I don't know, Doug, if that answers your your question, but we don't want to fall behind. And it's not just for because we want to be competitive. It's because we want to offer the students who are here the absolute best possible education. I think, too, over the past few years, we've expanded our athletic program to include a number of new teams. Amy Grolnick and I have been working closely together to expand the offerings for assemblies and opportunities for speakers on the issues that kids are concerned about. Um, we try, or tr this year have something scheduled every trimester for the students. Um, the expansion of clubs here, uh, we have 350 students and 48 clubs and five publications. I, I don't know too many independent schools that have student-sponsored clubs. Come to me, tell me what you want to do, bring five friends and a faculty advisor, you can get it going. Um, and they do. The students hit the ground running with the clubs, and we're continuing, continually expanding that. Rebecca and I have been working very closely on the senior community service um, efforts and streamlining that and offering different opportunities to the students. And I think um, Sharon said it, we're progressing, but we're a school that looks inward a lot. We look at ourselves very closely, we look at what we need to do, and we move to do it. Um, and I, I've, I've been here 12 years, and I find that's a really um, important part of being a member of a team here, that there's a willingness to take that inward look and make some changes. When we have the traditions that we build on. Right. Mm -hmm. Mark, Mark. Yeah, um, one of the students said something which kind of surprised me, or took note of. She said that there's no drama in, in the class. <coughs> and for parents of eighth graders, there's so much drama in this class. So I said, when did that happen? Is, is, it, is, it, is this something, since you know our, you know the eighth grade, is this something that's inherent in this class? Is this something that's, that's going to go away? There are occasions where I have sat down, actually, with this as a whole, so we try to also do things to facilitate discussions and to break up the drama. Um, yeah, I think some, to be honest, some class groupings are better than others or have less drama than others, but I do think, I mean, I've seen, I've been here, this is my third year now, so I've seen certain grades, you know, grow and change, and I do think that in the high school years, it gets better than the middle school years. 
as far as relationships. And I do see as the grades grow and as more kids, I mean this year I think we've seen that as more kids come together in each grade and in ninth grade, more kids come into the grade and it just changes the dynamics in a good way. And so I see, especially the ninth grade this year and the tenth grade this year, and even the eleventh grade this year, I really see some nice like coming together when there may have been drama in the past. Because I do think there's maturity and comfort. Um, and they do kind of, you know, what they talk about becoming their own person. And I think they sort of learn to accept, like, this is who I am, and these are my good friends, and I'm not going to worry about what those three good friends are doing. I'm going to worry about what my friends are doing. And that happens, I think, over time. And it's usually the post middle school. Mm -hmm. And is that, is that going to happen different for these kids in public school versus here? Well, I think we offer them opportunities. Um, this year, we initiated a new program for ninth graders. At the beginning of the year, we took the entire class out to Camp Green Lane in Harleysville. And um, Judge, Sean, myself, Laura Stern, Lauren Bertie Hyatt, who's not here tonight, um, offered the students a series of workshops. What goals do you have for high school? What kind of leader do you want to be in the high school here? Judge did something on, um, I use the word stereotypes, but like roles labeling. kids play in high school. Yeah, labeling. Labeling. Roles kids play in high school. And we um, challenged them in some physical ways with a ropes course and some games that we played. And I, I found that having those opportunities, as, and this ninth grade I think would agree, brought the group together. They got to know each other very early on. They were away from school and the drama of the lockers in the hallway or the lunchroom or whatever. And it was an opportunity just to be together. And we found it was really successful. And I, I think those of us that teach ninth grade would say it gave them a sense of cohesiveness right from the start that may help prevent some of that drama as the years continue. But I, I definitely see so much less drama in the high school I, uh, than in the middle school. It's just the age. It, it, and I, it sounds sort of pat to say it's just the age. but. Um, the number of middle schoolers that come into my office to discuss a conflict or an issue and how they deal with it versus how Sophia, who I never see in my office about drama, but <laughs> how Sophia might come in and it, it, the dramatic change between 8th and 12th, mm -hmm. it's just in terms of how they deal with relationships. It's amazing to watch in a good way. And be grateful you don't have an 8th grade girl. <laughs> <laughs>
anybody here. And you can take these or you can leave them. And please take some food on your way out. Drive safely. Watch out for that black ice. Thank you. Thank you.